All right. Okay. We're carrying on with James. Quick pick up where we are. Just the flow of thought in James. If you have that outline that I gave you the first week, you know how I see it. But after encouraging his readers to endure the oppression that they were facing from the rich unbelievers and warning them not to slander God during their trials, James in chapter 1 verse 19 through chapter 2 verse 13, he calls them to be doers of the word in the midst of their trials. Specifically, he calls them to be doers of the word with regard to their anger and their oppression toward the rich uh, who were oppressing them toward those people. He wants them to be doers there and he calls them to be doers with regard to their favoritism toward the rich at the expense of the poor believers. And then in chapter 2 verses 14 to 26, he defends that call for them to be doers of the word. So he's put that out there. You need to be doers, not just hearers. You need to do and then he defends that call in 2.14 to 26 against this circulating false idea that doing, that works, somehow are irrelevant or insignificant for those in Christ. That idea is out there among those to whom James is writing. And as I said last week, that false notion, it probably originated in a misunderstanding or a misrepresentation of Paul's doctrine of justification by faith. Now when we ended, we were looking at 2.14 to 17, where James shows the error of that claim, that works are irrelevant for Christians. He there shows the error of it by appealing to an everyday example. I want to read that again, repeat a little bit, and then we'll carry on. On, click, there we go. He says, what good is it, my brothers, if someone claims to have faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and lacking daily food and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and eat your fill, but you do not give to them what is necessary for the body, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Now, the Apostle Paul, he began preaching in Syrian Antioch in the mid-40s. You see he's preaching there in, in Acts chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. And the Jewish Christians who had been scattered by the persecution following Stephen's death, they had traveled to Antioch and to other places outside of Palestine. And you can see that in Acts chapter 11, verse 19. Now, some of those Jewish Christians who had been scattered out there in this area where Paul was preaching had apparently misinterpreted Paul's doctrine of justification by faith as an excuse for moral laxity. They had taken what Paul is saying that way, reducing faith to mean simply mental assent. Simply believing certain facts were true. That that's all that was required. That's all that is meant by faith. You simply give your mental assent to a, sort of, to a set of facts or propositions. And if you believe those things are true, that's it. That's all that's involved. And apparently they had taken that... That and had that misunderstanding. And news of that misunderstanding apparently had reached the church in Jerusalem. James is writing from there. So he calls them to be doers, doers, doers. But he knows that among the people to whom he's writing, there is this mistaken idea that works are irrelevant. So he's going to defend that, his call. Because he knows they're going to be saying, well, that's crazy. We don't have to do that. Why are you saying do, do, do when all it is is we believe these things to be true? That's all that's required. Okay, so he's going to defend it against that. And he first shows the error of that doctrine from an everyday example. And it was an example with which they were very familiar, I suspect. And he tells them, he says, look, just as lip service to the poor is of no value. You see, something they would have known. They were poor. They were oppressed. They were oppressed. 
And they knew what it was like for people to come and say to them, Oh, yeah, yeah, hope things go well with you. But will not give them anything. Words without deeds in that case, they knew full well was meaningless. It was just talk. It had no value. And so he's drawing an analogy. He says, I want you to see... Just as you recognize that words to the poor without deeds that accompany those words have no value, well, in the same way, a faith that is divorced from deeds that has no accompanying works is of no value. So he first is attacking this false idea with this everyday example, this idea of, quote, faith only. Now, there is a sense in which faith only is correct. But you have to know what faith means. Mental assent only. No, no, no. But when I say, quote, faith only, I'm talking about what James is talking about, mental assent. So he first says, look, from this everyday example with which they were familiar. Then he's going to show the error of this faith only idea that's circulating among those to whom he's writing. He's going to show it by the fate of demons. He says in 2.18 and 19, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without works. I'll show you my faith by works. You believe that God is one. You do well. The demons also believe and shudder. The demons also believe and shudder. See, because biblical faith involves a surrender of will. Not simply an acceptance by the mind. Because that's the case... Works are an inevitable companion of biblical faith. They're faith's vital signs. See, works are faith's vital signs. James imagines this hypothetical third party taking issue with that perspective by saying, you, this is the, this is the person in James's audience who claims that works are not an essential accompaniment of faith. He says, somebody out here, this hypothetical third person, will say, you have faith, I have works. As though it's the same thing. Six and one half dozen the other. As though both are acceptable. You have faith, divorced from works. I have works. And this person saying, you say, it just doesn't matter. One's got one, one's got the other. Both are acceptable. Well, James denies that both are acceptable. They're not both acceptable. And as proof that belief disconnected from life, a a belief that is simply this mental ascent that has no impact on one's life, as proof that belief disconnected from life is inadequate, he cites the case of demons. He cites that case. They believe there's only one almighty God. They believe that completely. They understand that and they know that, but because they're unwilling to act on that belief, in other words, they will not order their lives and their existence according to that belief. They will not surrender to it. I know there's one almighty God, but I will continue to exist and to live as though he's not almighty God. And he says, that will not help them because they believe that is true, but what's their outcome? And shudder. Well, what are they shuddering for? They're shuddering because they're doomed. You see, they're shuddering because their faith is, faith is the eternal fire, as Jesus says in Matthew 25, 41, and as you see in Revelation. That's their faith. But you say, wait a minute, but they believe, they have mental assent, they know these facts are true as sure as anything. But he says that won't help them because that kind of faith, that kind of belief that is simply mental assent, that's inadequate. That's not saving faith. That won't help them, you see. And then in in 20 to 26, he shows the error of this faith only from Scripture. He says... But are you willing to understand, O foolish man, that faith without works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith worked with his good works, 
And that faith was made complete by the works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, And Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Faith in this context meaning mere mental assent, you see. He says, likewise, was not Rahab the prostitute also justified by works when she welcomed the messengers and sent them out by a different way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Now here James is showing this from Scripture. Faith that saves is a living faith. It is a faith that finds expression in obedience. A dead faith. A dead faith is one that says, Lord, Lord, but refuses to act as though that confession is true. Just like the demons who are convinced and know the truth of the matter, but will not surrender to that truth. Well, that's not biblical faith. As Jesus says in Luke 6, 46, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say? He said, you know, anybody can say the words, but the question is, is there a reality behind your confession so that when you say, I am Lord, that includes your submission to that. Not simply your recognizing it, but your submission to it. See, to speak of a faith that has no works, that's like speaking of a human life that has no pulse, no respiration, no brain waves. It has no vital signs. And yet you're saying it's, it's a, a human life. Well, that's how faith is. There are vital signs of faith. There is the inevitable accompaniment of genuine, biblical, saving faith. It manifests itself inevitably in a person's life. Now given that obedience inevitably accompanies saving faith, one cannot remain justified before God without obedience. The refusal to obey is conclusive proof that one that there's no saving faith there's only lip service and you say well why is James stressing so much the obedient side of this equation and he's doing that because he was addressing those who were in danger of divorcing faith from life who were hearing that they could be saved and be right with God through a non working faith through a dead faith through a faith that was mere mental assent and he's correcting that because he has just called them you need to do this do this don't just hear it do it do it do it and so he knows there are going to be people out there going well I think James has lost his mind he's crazy James doesn't know the gospel he doesn't know the truth he doesn't know you say by faith and James by the Spirit of God is letting him know that's not the case Now these Jewish believers, they accepted that Abraham's obedience in offering Isaac was indispensable to his continuing justification before God. If he had refused to obey, if he had said to God, "Uh -uh, I'm not going to do that. I know you're God and all that stuff, but that's it, baby. I'm not going to do that. If he had done that, if his faith had ceased then, to be a matter of both mind and will, he would no longer have been right with God. In other words, if his faith ceased to be allegiance, Matthew Bates in his book, he uses that term, and I think it's helpful. The idea of allegiance. When you say allegiance, it's easier for us to understand that that inherently carries with it a sense of surrender and obedience than just faith. See, faith, it's easy for us to break that off and make it just mental assent. And that's not what biblical faith is. Well, James says a man is justified by works, not by faith alone. And he cites Abraham in Genesis 22 and Paul, of course, in Romans 3.28, Romans 4.1-8. He says a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. And he cites Abraham in Genesis 15 as an example. 
So what's going on and how are these positions to be understood? The first thing is, is that works are not the basis on which God's grace is bestowed. Works and performance and obedience and doing, that is not the basis on which God's grace is bestowed. Rather, those things are the byproduct of the faith on which God's grace is bestowed. That's important. Because you recognize then that all people will be at different levels of manifest, manifesting that faith. So some will be tortured by other things and have a greater struggle with other things, but they still have a pulse. They still have respiration. The faith is real. But if you start saying that it is this that earns my standing, well, then it better be flawless. And then you know you're doomed, right? I'll just ask your wife. You know you're doomed. And so that's an important thing to recognize is that faith is not the basis. Since biblical faith, true saving faith, this allegiance, since it necessarily works, the absence of works indicates the absence of saving faith. So works are relevant to judgment. One is, quote, justified by them only in a secondary or derivative sense. And that's how I understand those verses that speak, speak of one's works as the basis of judgment. And we looked at some of those last week, like Matthew 25, 31 to 46, John 5, 29, Revelation 20, 12, and there are a number of others. You see these things go together. Saving faith in this submission, this allegiance, inevitably produces things and so when I'm talking about judgment, I can look at these things because they are the markers of this. So I can speak of that that way. But the distinction has to be made because the grace is bestowed and received on the basis of faith and trust and surrender and submission and all that. Not on the basis of what it produces, but it inevitably produces things. And that's important to recognize that distinction. Now the faith of which Paul spoke... Paul never spoke of a dead faith. When Paul talked about faith, he talked about not just mental assent, but he talked about the whole thing. The idea that you're surrendering mind, will, all of this. You see, it wasn't this sterile, inactive faith. And you can see, for example, Galatians 5, 6, he says, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision mean anything. Rather, what matters is what? Faith working. Faith working through love. That's what matters. He this wasn't Paul's idea, and it wouldn't have been anybody's idea other than a distortion. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, 19, circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. But what? Keeping the commandments of God is everything. Well, Paul's the, you know, Paul's the one who says salvation by grace through faith. But Paul says keeping the commandments of God is everything. How can he say that? Well, I'm trying to explain to you how he can say it. Because it is a mistake to understand biblical faith as divorced from surrender, divorced from will, divorced from a commitment to live according to the confession. Now, the issue that Paul faced, the issue that he faced in his ministry were whether Gentiles were obligated to obey the set or the package or unit of commands that comprise the Mosaic Law. That set or package that included such distinctive elements as circumcision, sacrifices, the priesthood, feasts, holy days, ritual purity laws, food laws. So you had these things that are these eternal moral desires of God that were there before they were embedded in the Mosaic Covenant, right? I mean, doesn't the flood of Noah's day testify to the reality of moral requirements before Sinai? So you have these desires, the moral desires of God. They are embedded in the Mosaic Covenant along with other things that are peculiarly covenantal and that are designed, some of which are designed simply to separate 
Israel from the surrounding nations, some of which are designed for Israel to function as a theocracy, but they are not these same kind of eternal moral desires. But the Mosaic law has those eternal moral desires plugged into it. And so it, it includes those things. And that's Paul's issue was whether the Gentiles who are becoming Christians, whether they're obligated to obey that whole set. See, when you speak of the Mosaic law, you speak of the package or body or set of commands that are embedded in that pact or covenant. The whole set. And so the question is, were Gentile converts required to obey the Mosaic law? The whole thing. Now, though the Mosaic law, it was an interim, a short-term, subsidiary covenant that was given until God's earlier promise to Abraham began to be fulfilled in Christ. That was how the Mosaic Covenant is designed to function. You have this promise to Abraham, through your seed all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And so you have this promise here. Now later comes this interim, this short term, subsidiary covenant, the Mosaic Covenant, that is given to them until the promise to Abraham begins to be fulfilled in Christ. And what happened is, some of the Jews, they wound up giving this interim subsidiary Mosaic Covenant priority over the prior Abrahamic Covenant. The Abrahamic Covenant is ongoing. This is a subsidiary covenant, but some Jews gave it a priority over the Mosaic Covenant. I mean, over the Abrahamic Covenant. They gave the Mosaic Covenant a priority over the Abrahamic covenant and they exalted it to the point that the works of the law all of those things embedded the do's and don'ts embedded in that Mosaic covenant those commands they made that the basis of one's relationship with God and thus the basis of one's inheritance you say why do you think some Jews misused the Mosaic law that way well, it seems to me evident that some are doing it from Luke 18, 9 to 14, Romans 3, 27 to 4, 8, Romans 9, 30, uh, 9, 30 to 10, 8, Galatians 2, 16, Galatians 3, 2, 3, 5, 3, 10, Philippians 3, 2 to 11. It seems clear to me that some of them had exalted this to the point that the commands that were part of that covenant, they had turn that into the basis of one's relationship with God. They had, they had done that. Now, in other words, some of them had turned the Mosaic Law into a legalistic path of salvation. Now, I know that we often treat the Mosaic Law as that's how it was intended, but that's wrong. The Mosaic Law was never this idea, well, under the law, you earn your standing before God, and then here comes Jesus and... That's just crazy. Okay? Never like that. Salvation by grace through faith always. But what has happened? We have some Jews who have then, because of their attachment to the Mosaic law, they're giving it a priority over the Abrahamic covenant. They have transformed it or twisted it into a legalistic path of salvation. Making salvation something gained by works... See, doing that, it impermissibly changed the prior and ongoing Abrahamic covenant by canceling out the promissory character of this prior and ongoing Abrahamic covenant. He promised it. He gives it. They make it by works. They supersede this, and in doing that, they cancel out. The promissory character. You can see that in Romans 4, 13 to 17. Galatians 3, 15 to 18. This idea that that is the effect. What you're doing is canceling out the promissory character of the prior and ongoing Abrahamic covenant. But this is what some of them had done. Now part of Paul's explanation for why the Gentiles were not obligated to obey the Mosaic law Contrary to the Judaizers' insistence, right? You know the Judaizers. You look in Acts 15, 1, 15, 5. You have to obey. And these are, of course, the people that Paul jumped on in Galatians. 
You have people who are saying, look, if you become a Christian, you are then obligated to obey the Mosaic law. Lock, stock, barrel, that's it, you're in. Okay, that's what's going on. So part of Paul's explanation for why the Gentiles were not obligated to obey the Mosaic law, contrary to what these Judaizers were assisting, part of it was that one standing before God is not based on works. It is a gift bestowed by God on the basis of faith. You see in Romans 3.28, 4, 1 to 8. Okay, so, so to the extent, to the extent that Jews sought to bind the Mosaic law out of a belief that obedience to that law achieved or was the basis of one's salvation, as I just said, you had some who had taken the law and distorted it that way. They had turned it into a legalistic path of salvation so their relationship with God was based on their performance of those laws. So to the extent that was true, Paul tells them that no, that's wrong. It's not based on one's works but on one's faith. So you are wrong in that and therefore you cannot bind that on Gentiles. Now that's part of how he approached the problem. Another part of his explanation why the Gentiles were not obligated to obey the Mosaic law was that the Christ event had rendered the old covenant obsolete. It had rendered that so that you had this interim subsidiary covenant which from the promise of Abraham this was to be enforced until the promise to Abraham began to be fulfilled in Christ. Now we have the Christ event so this covenant has been rendered obsolete and with it the laws, the body of laws that were embedded in that. So he tells them, listen, it is by faith, not by works, so you're wrong if you're trying to impose it on them because you have a mistaken idea that that is the basis of your relationship with God. You're wrong about that. You're also wrong because Christ rendered that covenant obsolete and in that he rendered obsolete the set of commands that were embedded and were part of that pact or covenant. So Paul approaches that in those ways. And you see that in 2 Corinthians 3, 4 to 18, Galatians 3, 15 to Galatians 4, 7. Indeed, the fact that some of the Jews clung to the Mosaic law, that they insisted on applying the Mosaic law beyond the time of its divinely designed obsolescence. They insisted on clinging to it beyond that time. That was evidence that they had in fact distorted it into the basis of their salvation. You see, that's part of why they're clinging to it. Because they've got this idea that our salvation lies in the performance of those things. So how can we have those things pass? And so it's just further evidence that you had that distortion going. Now the fact Christians are not under the Mosaic Law. That does not mean that no commands in the Mosaic Law have an ongoing or renewed or re-expressed applicability. They do. Some moral requirements of God that were included in the Mosaic set of commands continue to be applicable and indeed they find their full expression in the new covenant the law of Christ as I said last week which is based on love that law it includes some of those same commands not by virtue of the being under the Mosaic Covenant it includes some of those same commands but it doesn't include things like circumcision and the myriad food laws and Sabbath regulations and festival observances and sacrificial rites you see, there are these things that are, quote, amoral. In other words, they were designed to distinguish Israel from its neighbors. They were part of the theocracy which no longer goes. And these other things that are fully fulfilled in Christ, like the sacrificial system. But that doesn't mean that things like children obey your parents that Paul can talk about in Ephesians 6. What do you say? What, you know, there are many times that these things are looked to. 
and cite it. And you say, well, he can't cite that. Paul doesn't know what he's talking about. The law is gone. Well, Paul's inspired, <laughs> right? So Paul can cite these things that have ongoing or renewed or re-expressed applicability in the new covenant as part of the law of Christ that's centered in love. You think, you think requirements of adultery and these kinds of things that were there in the old covenant? You think they're not part of the obligation of loving your neighbor as yourself? No, they are. They are, and that's the idea. Now, the issue James faced, okay, so that's kind of just, a, that's Paul. You're saying, what's up with Paul? And that's kind of a quick thing of the issue that Paul faced. It's two different things that are going on. And if you don't have a good understanding of that, it's easy to get confused about what's up with Paul and James. Paul is dealing with that. The issue James faced was whether mere mental assent to the truths of Christ, whether that was sufficient for salvation. That's because some people had distorted or misunderstood what Paul was saying. So James is dealing with that. And then, in fact, Abraham's justification would not have continued without works, which his audience would have accepted. The fact it wouldn't have continued without works shows that saving faith is more than the mere mental assent for which some of them were contending. Okay, so he shows them that that's, that's, that's the issue he's dealing with. He declared, no, it's not. Mere mental assent, if that's how you're defining faith, if you're talking about simply your assent to certain truths without a surrender and a submission to those truths, a commitment to live in according, according to those, if your faith is just that mental assent and not something that is much deeper and richer than that, well, then that's not saving faith. And Paul would have agreed with it. There's no question. We looked at those things, how Paul, faith working, obeying the commandments of God is everything. Paul would have never said, that's fine, you go ahead and be as morally lax as you want to be, but just be happy that you're saved by faith. He would have never said that. Here's something from uh, Daniel Wallace. This is a, from his uh, Greek grammar, Beyond the Basics. He says, both James and Paul would agree, I believe, with the statement... Faith alone saves, but the faith that saves is not alone. That's the idea. That's the idea. Douglas Moo says, Christians need to continue to pay attention to the warning of James that true faith is to be tested by its works and that only a faith that issues in works is genuinely saving faith. James recognizes that Christians continue to sin, so he clearly does not expect 100% conformity to the will of God. That will not happen until Jesus returns and our sanctification is completed. You and I will march and wrestle and struggle with sin until that day. Okay, so he's not talking about some kind of sinless perfection. He says, but how, how high must the percentage be? Ah... That's where, we, that's where we struggle. How many works are necessary to validate true saving faith? James, of course, gives no answer. But what we can say with confidence on the basis of James's teaching is that the claim of anyone who's totally unconcerned to lead a life of obedience to God to have saving faith must be questioned. And that's why I say you have to leave room, you see. Because what are the vital signs? Vital signs can vary. How strong is the respiration? How strong, you see? But somebody who lives like a pagan, but says, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'm sleeping with my girlfriend. Praise the Lord. I'm doing whatever. I'm getting drunk. You pick it. I'm doing and I'm living this way. I'm beating my wife. Whatever it is, the sin that someone wants to cling to and make it idol of. And just says, I praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. All right. Okay, do you, do, you, do you see this is the idea? So you can't allow the fact, well, they're, it's difficult sometimes to know. And, yes, I know that. I mean, that's how life is. There are difficult judgments and things to know. But that doesn't cause you to abandon the principle and what's been revealed. That biblical saving faith produces something. It produces works it produces some kind of obedience. It has vital signs. And that seems to me to be obvious from what 
James is saying. It's obvious to Douglas Moo. It's obvious to many other people. Dietrich Bonhoeffer. You know Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He was a brilliant young German pastor. He was a Lutheran. He was in Germany. He was a seminary teacher who opposed Adolf Hitler's policies. And he was executed by the Nazis just days before the Allies swept in to liberate Germany. And in his famous book, The Cost of Discipleship, Bonhoeffer says, Cheap grace is the grace we bestow on ourselves. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. Baptism without church discipline. Communion without confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship. Grace without the cross. Grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. Costly grace is the kingly rule of Christ for whose sake a man will pluck out the eye which causes him to stumble. It is the call of Jesus Christ at which the disciple leaves his nets and follows him. Right. right? See, this is, what, this is the thing. When you and I become Christians, it is not simply, I have been persuaded that certain things are true. Being persuaded that Jesus is true only puts you in the valley of decision. You have to believe that. Now the question is, will you commit your life and follow Him as Lord? You believe He's Lord. You've come to believe those things. Now will you follow Him that way? That's the question. So you're not even in the valley of decision until you're there. So when you become convinced of that, now the question is, okay, you now know this is the truth? Are you going to say yes to Him? Are you going to follow Him? Are you going to give Him your life? Is that the first bell or second bell? All right. So, so that's the thing. Are you going to give him your life? That's what Christianity is. There's nothing more radical than you say, yes, I, you show me how you want me to live. That's what I'll do. But I like doing this. I, like, I didn't ask you that. The question is, are you going to follow Jesus? Have you given Jesus your life? And if you have... When the one who is your Lord, the one who bought you, the one who died, when he calls you and says, this is how I want you to be, well then you set your sights and you start on a journey. Okay, do you walk perfectly? No. But you fall, you get up. You fall, you get up. But you keep looking at the Lord. What would you have me do, Lord? What would you have me do? When he calls you and says, what you're doing is wrong and immoral, out! Right? has to be. You can't closet and harbor these things. Have these idols and then claim allegiance to Jesus as Lord. It's just crazy. Uh, Rahab, you see at the end here, Rahab's faith was expressed in her welcoming and protecting Israel's spies. She didn't say, well, I believe in God and then refuse to honor the agents of God. She didn't do that. Her walk matched her talk where she acted. And we always have the question, well, you know, she deceived them and all that. Other questions? But here we have a person who is, James is saying, look, he says, like, was not Rahab justified by works when she welcomed the messengers and sent them out by a different way? He's saying that her faith acted and it wasn't simply sterile mental assent. And so he's correcting this idea that would be impeding his audience from receiving his call to be doers and not listeners. He wants to get rid of that because he's just laid out a call. They're getting the hammer and he says, yeah, that's true, you're getting the hammer, but I want you to deal with your anger. I want you to deal with your evil speech. I want you to deal with your, uh, your favoritism of the rich over the poor and humiliating the poor. Yeah, but I want... No, no, he says, I'm talking to you. And now he's dealing with this idea that would allow them to get away from what he's saying. And he's not going to let them do it. He's not going to let them do it. And then in chapter 3, he says, not many of you should become teachers. Now, do you think, you know, this is like people say, well, he's just kind of randomly... Do you not see how this flows right from what he's been talking about? He's been addressing a false understanding. And how dangerous that could be. Then he says, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, because you know that we will receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in speech, he's a complete man, 
able to bridle the entire body as well. The existence of this error, that mere mental assent to the truths of Christ, that that is sufficient for salvation. That is what prompts James to issue this caution regarding teachers. He says that not many of them should become teachers. And the reason he gives is that teachers will receive a stricter or greater judgment. Those who stand up and, and claim to speak on God's behalf, to say, thus saith the Lord, they will have a stricter judgment. Douglas Moo says, teachers, because they bear so much responsibility for the spiritual welfare of those to whom they minister, will be scrutinized by the Lord more carefully than others. Jesus warned, from everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded, and from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. God has given to teachers a great gift and entrusted to them the deposit of the faith. He will expect a careful account of the stewardship. Paul reflects just this sense of responsibility as he addresses the elders of the church at Ephesus. He stressed that he had been faithful to his task as a herald of the gospel. I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. And so this is the idea in teaching that there's this stricter judgment and the reason this stricter judgment should cause them to think twice about becoming teachers is that of all the ways that humans stumble of all the ways humans stumble sinning in speech is among the easiest so here you have this idea you have a stricter judgment why should that cause uh, why should that uh, all right, uh, Lord willing, uh, not next week, uh, two weeks, uh, we'll carry on. Thank you for coming.